Well, hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good night, depending on <laughs> where you are. <laughs> Welcome to these talks or discussions sponsored by the Ronnie K. Rani Center for Energy Solutions from the University of Oklahoma. Today, we have a very inter interesting topic. We're going to talk about carbon capture. And with me, we have Jairo Corredor. He's a petroleum engineer with about 30 years of experience, actually 30 plus years of experience in the industry. He has worked in Alaska, Saudi Arabia, South America. Essentially, if there is a reservoir, he has been there. So with me, Jairo, we are going to discuss how the oil industry can actually help curb climate change. Big warning, big warning. We're going to assume from this point forward the scientific consensus that climate change is real, it's happening, and we are going to assume, of course, the scientific consensus that the CO2 emissions are the main cause for that uh, climate change. If you disagree with this, this discussion or this uh, talk probably is not for you, but if you are with the scientific consensus, you're going to find this discussion very interesting. So in order to begin with this, let's first figure out what carbon capture really is. So what is carbon capture? Well, it's defined as a process of capturing CO2 before it reaches the atmosphere. You need to capture it, transport it, and store it in a place where it's not going to be, or it will never be again in contact with the atmosphere, typically underground. That's the way we do it. The, the part of storing it is very important. It's called sequestration, and there are legal uh, implications to that definition because in some states, for instance, to be able to call a project sequestration, you have to guarantee that the CO2 will be stored for decades or centuries. Some states actually legalize this very specifically, say at least one century or at least two decades or whatever. But the storing part is the important part where you are actually going to store the CO2 away from the atmosphere and prevent the CO2 or this carbon, the CO2 reaching the atmosphere. Uh, why do we want to do this? Of course, because of greenhouse gas effects and CO2 in the atmosphere. Right now we have 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 in the atmosphere is a big problem. We can combine this process of carbon capture with with something that is called carbon removal. Carbon removal has a potential to reduce CO2 from the atmosphere too. And sometimes when people call carbon capture and storage, car carbon capture utilization and storage, or carbon removal, they don't know what they are talking about. They use these different terms to refer to the same thing. So I want to make a, a few differences and specify a, 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 big, a little bit of a couple details here in the definitions. To be strict, carbon removal will take CO2 from the atmosphere. So when you take the air, or the carbon, excuse me, when you take the carbon from the air, we're gonna call that carbon removal. Uh, for this, we have devices, there are machines that can do this, and we're not gonna go into, into details because we don't have the time for that, but essentially there are several methods that you can use to capture or remove CO2 from the atmosphere. The moment that you have the CO2 removed from the atmosphere, we're going to call that process carbon removal. Carbon capture, which is the one that we're going to discuss a little bit more detail here, doesn't allow the CO2 to get to the atmosphere. The idea is to capture the CO2 before it reaches the atmosphere. So you capture the CO2 from the manufacturing plant or the electric plant that is emitting these emissions, is creating these emissions. You capture it. You inject it into the underground or you utilize it, depending on which method you're using, and you prevent the CO2 from reaching the atmosphere. That's really, strictly speaking, what carbon capture is all about. Uh, Jairo, have you heard anything about uh, people <clears throat> talking about carbon capture and carbon removal and this confusion on the definitions or anything like that? Uh, just uh, one comment is uh, because I know people, Sometimes people are very thorough in their definitions. Uh, in carbon removal, it's not just air. It could be also from the uh, sea, uh, getting the, the CO2 that is uh, uh, stored at the, uh, in the oceans. Uh, and when you capture that 
it has the advantage that also reduce the acidity of the water, which is uh, uh, also a problem. Very well, yes, that's, that's absolutely correct. The carbon removal part also includes when you are removing CO2 from the ocean, and, and that's another method, and there are other different devices that can do that, and yes, acidification of the ocean is a big deal. Well, with that said, uh, where can we do this? Or, or, I mean, why and where can we capture CO2? Well, there are uh, different sources, mainly the power generators. This means natural gas plants or electric coal power plants, like the one that we have in the picture is a nuclear plant. Uh, believe it or not, nuclear plants, even though they mainly emit steam as a the, the, the one thing that you see here in these chimneys is steam. There's also part of the process where you have backups engines and uh, diesel engines running to support the, 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 the plant, and then you're going to have CO2 emissions too. Factories and manufacturing facilities, of course. Almost any factory will run electricity, will run on engines, will run diesel generators, will run kind of uh, machines that will produce CO2, sometimes in enough quantities to have a chimney and actually have emissions there. And if needed, there are some ideas uh, thrown in the uh, scientific community right now as to how to capture CO2 from multiple small sources that are geographically close. So let's say you have a neighborhood and uh, uh, that neighborhood, all the, the houses are powered by a diesel uh, generator. If every house has a diesel generator, there's a way to connect all these diesel generators and collect the CO2 from, from these houses. Now, this doesn't happen often in America, because in America we have all these uh, electrical lines, but in some other countries you do have periods of time where people in, in some cities or small towns they are going to use generators in their houses to power their, their homes. So there are several ideas on where to capture the CO2. Uh, where Again, when we talk about capturing, we are not talking about <coughs> excuse me removal. We're taking the CO2 before it reaches the atmosphere. Now, why? We want to do this. Again, like I said at the beginning, we are under the assumption of the scientific consensus right now that climate change is real and CO2 has a big, back, big part or, or a big deal to, to be part of this problem. And several studies actually have shown, this is a study that was published by the Energy Information Administration, but it was shown on a TED Talk, and I'm using the TED Talk from 2021 to show the graph here. If you want to keep the temperature of the world in, let's say, 20 to 30 years in the future, somewhere close to 2 degrees Celsius or below that, we're going to have to at least increase the carbon capture to about 7 gigatons of CO2. Now, if we want to allow 2 degrees, which is the scientific consensus that will say more than that is too dangerous, we're still going to need 4 gigatons. To give you a scale or an idea of the problem, currently, with today's carbon capture and utilization facilities, we are actually capturing about 0 0.04 gigatons of CO2 from facilities, uh, which means essentially that we need to somehow increase, not tenfold, but 100 times our current efforts of carbon capture to stay or remain in this world where temperatures are in the ballpark of two degrees Celsius or an increase of two degrees Celsius in the future. Now, seven gigatons is the recommended scientific consensus, which is even more, to remain below two degrees. Uh, and two degrees is, uh, doesn't sound like a lot, but in 40 years, in 30, 40 years, two degrees is actually pretty important. Uh, there are some consequences that we have seen already in the weathering and, uh, and in the uh, cyclones and changes in the climate that we have seen that will be even more severe if we allow the temperature to go beyond two degrees. So that's the scientific consensus, and that's why we want to do this. Now, this, here's where... I, yes, Jairo. Uh, <clears throat> this is the target to kind of maintain or, or, or being able to control the global warming. So the, the, the two degrees is the maximum that they think uh, we should be able to uh, maintain. But if we do nothing, 
Uh, the study shows that it could be between four to six degrees in the next 40 years. Uh, yeah. And if that gets to that point, uh, we will be in trouble. Yes, that's the scenario where some maps actually show Florida under the water and uh, oceans rising by more than three feet and so on and so. And, and we don't even want to discuss that because, again, there is a lot of debate about this, in, in, even in the scientific community right now, about the true consequences of how in more than two degrees. But the consensus says, like you mentioned, Jairo, if you remain, if you allow the temperature to, to increase no more than two degrees Celsius, the consequences are not going to be as severe as they could be. So this is something that we must do and we have to do uh, in the next 20 to 40 years again. Uh, now, Jairo, why don't you tell the, our audience the, what is enhanced oil recovery and why the oil industry has been injecting CO2 for decades? <clears throat> uh, CO2 as a mechanism to uh, increase the production of oil uh, what is called EOR, um, is a methodology has been for almost 60 years or more. And it, the process itself, the physics of the process are well understood and uh, is being used in, for many years. And it goes up and down depending on the oil price because in like in any um, enhanced oil recovery, it, the, the, the main problem is the economics. Um, the technical side that injecting the CO2 and the risks and so and so is, is uh, I think it will be uh, maybe a topic for a different talk. Mm -hmm. uh, basically what uh, the uh, CO2 does is it gets in contact with the oil and it could be uh, basically um, uh, diffuse into the oil and reduce the vis viscosity, increase the volume of the oil in ground. So it creates higher pressure and with the reducing viscosity, it makes the, the, the oil to flow easier and increase the production. Um, there are several methodologies depending on pressures and the kind of uh, reservoir that you have that could be what is called miscible displacement or immiscible depend on the type of oil that you have. Is it a light oil or a heavy oil? And the type of rock that you have. Uh, there are pros and cons, in, like in any process, and it can be, basically, it cannot be used everywhere. You have to screen your, your reservoirs and make sure that uh, they are in, in good standing for uh, receiving the CO2, like the well integrity, um, the type of um, steel that your pipes has, so they don't get affected for the um, acid that uh, the CO2 um, makes when getting in contact with water. Also, the type of cement that is behind pipe that also can get um, damaged and then you start leaking. So, because the idea is that you put the CO2 there, it helps you to increase the production, but at the same time, you want to keep the, that CO2 into the ground, either by absorption to the rock, dissolution in the water, and whatever happens with the oil, even with the uh, residual oil that also gets some uh, CO2 in there. Yes, that's amazing. Uh, most people don't realize that uh, CO2 injection is something that the oil industry has been doing for decades. Essentially, just like Heidel described, you inject CO2 in one well and you push. It's not. It's a little bit more complicated, like Heidel explained, it's miserable or immiscible, but you push the oil to another well where you can extract that oil and some of the CO2 that you injected. Now, of course, environmentalists are discussing this uh, injection of CO2 as not truly carbon capture because you are using CO2 for, for injection, but at the same time, you produce the oil that is going to generate CO2 later on when we burn it, essentially. So that there is a point to that, and we're going to discuss this in more detail. Manuel is asking uh, how this technology has been applied in the world 
and, and how how you are has been actually using the word. It, it's well known. It's been well known for decades. Uh, there is a significant project here in the United States, for instance. Uh, uh, Occidental Petroleum has, in the Permian Basin, has a significant CO2 injection project, successfully proven the technique. And actually, uh, it is my understanding that they have made a significant amount of money out of it. So it is an economically viable project, and it's an economically viable idea. The problem with the idea is that uh, Generally speaking, when you talk about carbon sequestration or ca carbon capture, you want the carbon to be injected and stay there. In this case, you are injecting the carbon and you're producing oil that is also going to produce carbon down the road. So the point here is, is this a good idea or not? Can be implemented in the United States or not? Just a moment ago, Heide was mentioning that you have to screen the reservoirs because this technique cannot be applied just in any reservoir. Uh, Heide, why don't you explain our audience about this map? Okay, uh, this is a, a, a map from the USGS that when I was researching yesterday, I found that it's very interesting. It's basically uh, they, um, the dark uh, green shows reservoirs that uh, are feasible for CO2 injection as a UR recovery. Mm, as you can see, uh, well, unfortunately, the oil it not necessarily is going to be nearby where the uh, cement or um, mm, steel plants are. There are some of the uh, industries that produce a lot of CO2 so you have to create a way to uh, transport the CO2 into the, the, where the reservoirs are. And that is one of the uh, difficulties and, 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 and increase in, in, in expenses for, for uh, uh, this process to work. Yes, look at this map. It says clearly that close to 4,000 4, different reservoirs in the United States are viable for as a candidate or as a project for CO2 injection. In other words, if we wanted to do carbon capture and use this CO2 to produce oil later on, this would be a very good idea. We do have the reservoirs, we do have the technology, and these people, the oil industry people, really know how to do it. I mean, Heido mentioned a, uh, one significant problem of this technology. If we have a, a plant that produces CO2, and the reservoir is miles away from that plant, we still need to transport the CO2 from the plant to the reservoir. But guess what, guys? The oil industry is really well known for transporting gases using pipelines since more than five decades ago. Actually, you could argue that close to a century now, if you take into account Rockefeller's first pipeline in the northeast of the United States. So the fact is, the oil industry can do this, they know how to do it, and it is a well-known technology, and we do have the reservoirs to do it. So, Heido, why is it that we are not doing it yet in mass scale? Everything goes in economics. Uh, if what you are going to inject costs you more than the oil that you are going to produce, then the uh, financially is, is not an option. Uh, so that is one of the big detrimental parts regarding uh, using this process in a mass scale. Now imagine if, if economics is the, the big uh, driver here, uh, and of course is the main driver in any, any business, imagine if the government actually incentivizes somehow uh, via tax deductions or taxes or any other uh, possible incentivization process, if, if the government incentivizes the CO2 injection, do you think that the industry will jump into this idea and start using it in, in, in these fields? Yes. Um, first of all, the oil industry is seen as the main culprit for, for the CO2 production. And we produce oil and gas that generate power that gives fluid, uh, excuse me, fuel for uh, international transportation, like flying international, but mainly to 
transport all the products that we have from China to everywhere in the world and the commerce basically live in that. And those are easily 1 billion tons of CO2 that the uh, international transportation produce. So you, you need to um, provide that fuel to be able the, to the economy to move. So mm -hmm. uh, the oil industry knows that they produce something that is required, but also has the problem that uh, everybody wants to drive the car, has hot water, electricity, and everything. But if you don't use the oil or the gas, you won't have it. So there is these two things that you have to show that you are willing to help in the process that is uh, a secondary product of the uh, product that you produce. So uh, there are two ways is basically uh, transporting the CO2 that is produced by other industries uh, using the flare gas that is something that is basically at the sometimes at the fields that you are using and re-injected. And the third one is uh, capturing the gas, the, excuse me, the CO2 from the air or from the, um, the um, sea, as we were talking, doing the removal, because removal. that is incumbent. You have air everywhere, so you don't need to move. The only thing that you need is to uh, incentivize the technologies to capture that CO2 in a massive way that can be used then for uh, injection into the geologic uh, formations. And the United States is a huge resource right now uh, for these ideas and this possible technology. As a matter of fact, even if you don't like the idea of enhancer recovery, even if you don't like the idea of CO2 injection to recover more um, oil, here in this other map, we can see the resources available to the United States to store CO2 only. In this case, this, this will be true carbon capture as defined, legally speaking, where you actually inject the CO2 and don't let it be used for anything else other than, than, than just storing it in the reservoir. These reservoirs have a capacity of about uh, 3,000 gigatons. And remember the, the picture that we showed before, where we were talking about an increase from about four to maybe even seven, 10 gigatons of CO2. The United States alone has the capacity for 3,000 gigatons of CO2 storage. So it's not that it's, the resources are not available. It's not that technology is not available. Uh, it's not that the know-how is not available. Right now, it seems that hydro is right, and the only thing that is not available is the economic incentive. So we need some economic incentive to do this in a massive scale, and we don't have too much time. I mean, according to our latest uh, scientific consensus, we need to act in the next three to four decades to do this as soon as possible to avoid those two degrees Celsius that we consider too dangerous. So let me go and tell our audience where the debate is. And, and Manuel was asking questions, uh, one of our audience uh, was asking questions about where, where you could use this in, in the coal industry. In this case, here you have actually your answer there, Manuel, you have coal that you extract from the ground, you go and use it in, in this case of a plant, plant. Uh, let's plant, yes. You use that, of course that plant produces the CO2, you take the CO2 to an oil company where it's going to inject it again into the ground and produce oil. And that oil that is produced by the oil company is gonna be used for gasoline, diesel, other means of fuel, and of course it's gonna produce more CO2. And this is the part that is creating a problem right now. The first question is, who's gonna get the credit for the CO2 injection? Is it gonna be the oil industry that injects the CO2 or is it gonna be the power plant that sends the CO2 to the oil industry? Or who, who's gonna be getting the credit? That's something to, to, to be discussed down the road. But the main problem here is the amount of emissions. A lot of people think that this two sections here where the injection and the emission of CO2 appear are the same, but they don't have to be the same magnitude. You could be injecting, let's say, 100 units, let's call it units, uh, 
of CO2 here, by the end, the usage is gonna produce only 80 units of CO2. So in reality, you will be storing indefinitely 20 units of CO2 permanently under the ground. And that's something that I decided to call carbon negative. Being carbon negative is when you have a system like this, where you are using coal to produce electricity and the CO2 that is produced as a consequence, you use it to produce gasoline. And at the end of the day, everybody wins because the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is actually less than if you had allowed this coal plant to produce the CO2 into the atmosphere. So the enhancer recovery project that sometimes is being criticized and, and not allowed to be defined as a carbon capture process, legally speaking, I will argue that could be, in fact, a true carbon capture process and, uh, or carbon sequestration process. You could be actually be carbon negative and be doing a, a really good deed for our atmosphere by actually using the CO2 in this manner. Now, again, the debate is there. Should we, should we really do this with coal and, and, and should we do it in a different way? Like Hyro mentioned, should we, instead of actually using the coal, should we capture the CO2 directly from the atmosphere? Uh, but think about other means of generating electricity other than the coal plant. There's bioenergy, biomass plants everywhere. They are not as massive or, or uh, they don't produce enough electricity as much as coal plants these days. Just so you have an idea, the United States right now uh, depends of about about 20% of the electricity generated in the United States, 20 to 25% of the electricity generated in the United States is actually generated via coal. But there is all my energy also uh, derived from bioenergy processes. So if you, instead of using the coal plant, you go to a plant that uses what is called biomass or bioenergy, you can still do the same process. And in this case, you're literally, in this case, you're being using carbon capture because you're not taking carbon from the ground and CO2 from the ground to gain, produce again more CO2. In this case, you're using the bioenergy process. So in, in theory, this process could be defined really as true carbon negative and true uh, carbon capture. Of course, there are legal implications to this and there are uh, business implications to this. But carbon capture is a process that can actually happen and can actually help uh, produce energy and at the same time save the atmosphere. Uh, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about which type of fuels produce CO2 because we don't have any of the magnitude of this. Now, Heido, do you want to explain to our audience what, what you found regarding the amount of emissions that you have by fuel type? Well, yes, uh, well, uh, this uh, uh, chart shows uh, 2020, where basically uh, carbon is about 34%, and oil and gas together are about 50%. So between those three uh, products, uh, we have almost 80%. One of the things that the oil industry has is the flaring of the gas. But that is just one percent, and is the is is that gas that flaring is something that can be readily available to inject in the reservoirs because it's right there. Uh, the other products are exported everywhere, and you cannot collect the fumes of the cars to be collected as as a, a viable product to be injected. So what we need to see is in what industries this oil and gas are burned and how willing are we to not use it or are we able to do it? Exactly. I, I mean, think about this. The magnitude of CO2 emissions right now, 40% of the total emissions are coming essentially from coal. Again, this is worldwide, not just the United States. But... 40% of emissions come from coal. So if we incentivize only the coal industry, if we incentivize them to get that CO2 close to a reservoir, and we incentivize the oil industry to inject that CO2 into the reservoir, we will be tackling this a significant portion of the problem. 
and and it's, again, it's not that we don't have the resource. We have the reservoirs. We have the storage a areas. We have the technology because uh, the oil industry knows very well how to transport and how to do this. The main problem here is the cost, the economic factor that Heidi was mentioning. If we don't have incentives, CO2 again is it's a product that nobody wants. So if you take that CO2 and you don't incentivize it, the industry essentially will find that it's a lot easier just to dump it into the atmosphere than to inject it into the ground. Because to inject it into the ground, you need to pay for the cost of transportation and pay for the cost of pressuring the CO2 into the reservoir and store it there. So really, the, the main issue here we're talking about is money. That's it. Are we going to incentivize these industries, the energy industry, coal generation, gas generation, the oil production industry, the downstream sector, the upstream sector, to work together and inject the CO2, even if it's used to produce more oil. And and in, in my opinion, and again, this is my opinion, I think that's the best and probably the fastest way to actually reduce significantly the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and keep it that below that 400 parts per million limit that we are right now. Uh, that said, uh, carbon captured directly from the atmosphere might be a little bit more expensive. Uh, again, you need these devices that will take the air and, and process the air through some uh, processes that will take the CO2 out of the air, and then you transport that CO2 into the injection well. So it's a lot easier just to take the, the the CO2 directly from coal plants or any other yeah well any other source that is producing oil uh, producing CO2 before it reaches the atmosphere. That said, uh, I think that we need to discuss uh, a little bit more down the road, Hyro, if you if you don't mind, uh, which are the main sources of CO2 in the world right now, and where should we prioritize our efforts? to maybe in the future implement carbon sequestration projects. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time right now, but I think uh, this could be a good second talk uh, in the future, maybe next week. Uh, are you going to be available, Jairo? Uh No, unfortunately, I'm gonna be in Colombia, but um, uh, I'm at return, I'll be happy. Or uh, I, I, I contact you, maybe I can do it from there. Um, anyway, yes, this is, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I believe that um, we can talk about uh, where we can do a major impact as industry and definitely uh, inject it as a EOR or just a sequestration into the formations is the most viable way to uh, capture the CO2. Uh, okay. So definitely I'll be happy to... Um, attend another um, conversation with you and thank you for inviting me. Okay, Jairo, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us in this interesting talk. Again, then we're gonna have that second conversation. We're gonna have carbon capture part two down the road as soon as Jairo is available again. And we're gonna discuss the details of where are the sources of this CO2 and which projects or which areas we need to tackle first to actually carbon capture in an efficient way and go to that fourth or seven gigaton uh, goal that has been established by uh, the scientific consensus. Thank you everybody for listening to us and I'll see you next week. Bye. Luis.